spend time sharing with you. Um, I've done this probably about three times now, so uh, you might be getting used to me, you might not. But anyway, it's really good to be able to share with you um, this morning. Um, that gospel reading today about the Pharisees, there was one word that came to mind when um, we were reading that passage, but it's not a word that was actually in the passage itself. It's the word legalism. Legalism. And when the Pharisees were challenging Jesus, they were challenging him on something that we might think, actually, that's, that's a good idea. What's wrong with it? Washing our hands before we eat. I'm sure that every one of us here do that. And I'm sure the children are told by their parents, wash your hands before we eat. It's hygienic. It um, stops us from getting ill. And yet the Pharisees, they weren't talking about hygiene. They weren't interested in hygiene. They were interested in their own laws and their own, own rules because they believe that anything that comes into your mouth um, defiles you. And that's, that's not true what Jesus was saying, but that's ridiculous because it's not what comes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your heart, what comes out of you, your mind. The trouble is that they, the Pharisees made laws of their own. Some of the laws, they even contradicted God's law. They were so hell-bent on laws because they believed that um, the only way to heaven, the only way to please God, is to obey every single law. Legalism puts rules and law before anything else, before anything else. And that got me thinking, that got me thinking about myself. Am I legalistic? Are there areas of my life where I'm legalistic? And I'm ashamed to say there are. There are places uh, in my life one of the problems I have is in driving, and I'm sure a lot of, particularly men, would um, probably relate to this, but I'm, I'm a terrible driver. Not so much the physical driving, but my attitude when I'm behind the wheel. Because I'm the sort of person that says, look at him doing that. What's he doing there? Why is he pushing in? And I, I, th I think that everyone should obey, obey the rules of the road. You know, I, I'm sort of thinking, you should be doing what the Highway Code says. You should be doing the, the everything right and being courteous on the road. But the reality is, of course, that's not true. Certainly, um, you know, when I've seen that, um, yesterday, uh, the, other, the other thing, of course, and I don't want to offend any of you cyclists here today, because I'm sure that you obey the rules of the, the road. But as I drive along in London here, I wonder how many cyclists actually understand what a red light is. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I've been on a journey where I haven't seen loads of, of cyclists going over red lights. Um, it's something that just happens, and people seem to accept it nowadays. Um, but it is disobeying the rules of the road. And I often think, I wonder what your job is. Are you a managing director? Are you a professional person? And yet you seem to think that when you're on the road, laws don't apply anymore, rules don't apply anymore. And so that's my area of being uh, legalistic, or at least one of them. Um, and I wonder what areas in your life you can look at and say, yes, I'm legalistic in that.
Now the Pharisees, of course, believe that the law in its entirety was, a, was the only way to please God. Obeying the laws, everything, mattered. people didn't matter, it was the law that matters. You need to obey the law, otherwise you won't um, believe. Uh, but the only thing is, they were spiritually blind. They saw what they wanted to see in scriptures and in, in the Jewish um, codes and, and practices. And, you know, that might be all right for them, but one of the biggest problems is that they actually led the whole of the Jewish nation in that same way. And so they were deceiving the people. They were supposed to be the leaders of, of the people, the Pharisees, but they were deceiving the people. Um, and they were leading them down the wrong path. You see, legalism puts laws above the gospel by establishing requirements for salvation beyond repentance and faith. So legalism puts the law above Jesus Christ, above um, salvation. And it focuses on narrow and rigid codes that, that the Pharisees think are obligate God to bless those who prove themselves worthy. So the Pharisees are saying, you obey the law, you're worthy and God will bless you. God will do things. The problem with that is that the Bible says that nobody can prove themselves worthy. You and I can't prove ourselves worthy. It's impossible. Romans 6.23, we've heard this um, quite a few times. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. You and I, the reality is that you and I have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Each one of us. Now we may think that legalism belonged into the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. Uh, but you, you know the big reality is legalism can actually be seen in our churches today. You know, some churches, they have strict do's and don'ts. You must do this as well as being saved. You must do this. Jesus plus. Um, and Carol and I actually went to a church and in that church there was a leader who believed that you had to obey the leader. The leader was the person in charge, the leader was the one who was ordained, the leader was the one who knew what they were doing. And if you disobeyed them or if you did something they didn't like, you'd, be, you'd end up in the sermon the next week. You'd be preached about. You know, and um, I've heard of churches where the minister has had to leave because the people are so legalistic about the service and the order of service and not wanting to change or develop or grow. They just wanted it this way, this way, this way. And the, and the leader got such stick that he had to leave or she had to leave. I've heard that. Um, so many times and that's sad that's sad that churches can do that you know even when you've got churches um, I've been to years ago been to evangelistic meetings where you've, you've got someone come and preach you know Billy Graham or one of those, Louis Palau, and you, you have a counselling team afterwards and you 
lead someone to Christ, as that's how they say, you show them in the, through the word how they can become a Christian. And that's great. But then you go on and say, right, now you're a Christian, you mustn't smoke, you've got to give up smoking, you've got to give up this, you've got to give up that, you've got to come to church every Sunday, you've got to pray every day, you've got to read your Bible every day, and this is a legalistic view of, of um, how a Christian should be. Yes, I agree with some of those things, that it's good, but unfortunately, do's and don'ts to a, a new Christian is not something that um, is very helpful. The phrase, as I say, comes to mind, and we've discussed this several times in our Bible study, actually, Jesus plus, Jesus plus. When we believe that it's Jesus and nothing else. Jesus and nothing else. Billy Graham's grandson, he said, legalism says God will love us if we change. God will love us if we change. But then he goes on and he says, the gospel says change, that God will change us because he loves us. See the difference? God, it's not us that need to change. We can't change in ourselves. That's the reality of life. We cannot change ourselves. We can try. We can do this, do that. But the reality is that it's only Christ that can change us. It's only God that can change us. I guess if we live our lives by the law, through legalism, then logically we must obey every single law there ever is. How many of us have ever obeyed every single law? We've been, done, we've been perfect in our lives. I certainly haven't. So in that case, if I live by the law, then there's no way that I'm going to heaven. No way. I mean, if you oh, I cut down those rules to the Ten Commandments, how many of us have obeyed all the Ten Commandments? I certainly haven't. I can't. It's physically impossible for me to obey all the Ten Commandments. Now, I wanted to illustrate this point but I do need some help. Um, are there three children here that um, want to come and help me? <coughs> yeah, come up. come up. It's very easy. All three of you come up. That's a good idea. Come on, all three of you. No? Come on, yeah, come on. That's be, that's be great. Well done, come on, well done. That's lovely. Okay, uh, now I'm going to give you something. The two boys, I'm going to give you something to hold. Okay. Right, what have we got here? Oh, you take one in. Hold that for me. You come over here. Come over here. That's it. So that everyone can see you. You come around this side. Okay. Now stretch it right out. Stretch it. That's it. Go back. Not too far. That's it. <laughs> well done. Now, imagine we were saying that we have to obey every single law, every single rule there is, in order for us to get to God. Yeah? There's God over here. There's a big gap there. As us. And we have to get there. But what if we obey every rule, every law except one? What would happen, I wonder? I want you to come in with me. Anyone you want. Just cut it. Uh, just cut it. That's it. That's it. Well done. Oh. 
Right, you see what's happened? There's now a no longer a link between man and God because you've, sinned, you've done something wrong, you've sinned. You've broken the law and therefore there's a gap there. So it's absolutely impossible to get to God by legalism. Thank you very much, that's really great. You see, no one can get to heaven by, very, by keeping the laws, not one of us. I know people, and there may be some here, who think that I go to church, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, I help people when they need help, and, it, I, you know, I go to church. I know about Jesus, I've heard about him every week in church, um, but yet they think that that's enough. They think that's all I need to do is to go to church, to do good things, and I obey all the rules and they think that earns them a place in heaven. I've even seen pictures of scales. Have you ever seen that, the scales? With the good deeds on one side, the bad deeds on the other side. And whichever ways the scales tip tells you whether you're going to heaven or not. All a load of rubbish. All a load of rubbish. Now, you may not want to hear that. You may not want to hear that you've been doing things wrong all this time by thinking that coming to church is the way of, of getting to heaven. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that it's by grace that we're saved, not of works, lest anyone should boast. By grace, it's only grace that can save you. You see, our hearts are deceitful above all things. You may remember a few weeks ago when Musa spoke, he spoke about David and lots of other leaders, well-known people in the Old Testament who were God-fearing, who loved the Lord, and yet, what did they do? They, they sinned. And not only did they sin, they sinned big time. David actually had someone killed, as, as, as um, Musa was telling us. And so if that could happen to David, it can happen to any of us. We need to be spiritually cleansed. We need to be, have our hearts clean. And it's only by the blood of Jesus, as we've been singing, it's only by the blood of Jesus that we can be washed, that we can be clean. Nothing, what can wash away my sins, is something we'll be singing later on. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only Jesus can cleanse us from our sins. Only Jesus can give us the forgiveness that we need to be saved. So if you're someone who thinks that because you're a good person, you're doing good, it will earn you a place in heaven, then you're wrong. I actually want to tell you a story, and it's a bit of a funny story, but it's good. In my younger days, when I was in the teens, I used to teach Sunday school at a London City Mission Hall in Greenwich. And in those days, it, 
we had Sunday school wasn't like here where the children go off and spend time then come back to the service it was a Sunday school that was just children in the afternoon and then we'd have a service for adults in the evening and and the children that came came from all, all around the local area and and they were they came from unchurched people families so their families didn't go to church but they enjoyed coming this was back in the 60s they enjoyed coming to sing and to hear god's word preach and i had this sunday school class and i was teaching on this subject of being clean having heart, clean hearts before god and <laughs> one one day after i was teaching a few couple of days after the mother of one of the boys came to see the missioner who was in charge and he she wanted to know what we were teaching in the sunday school because the boy was having a bath and well, while he was having the bath he asked his mum how can i be clean in the inside how can i be washed on the inside see he had grasped some of the sunday school lesson but not all of it but it was also a good opportunity for the um for the missioner to talk about uh, the reality of our salvation so we need to be as the as the word said spiritually clean david said in the first start in the psalm we read creating me a clean heart O oh god and put a right spirit in me and that's what we need to do the, the the pharisees were foolish they thought it was what went into the heart that, that was um defiled but it wasn't it was what came out of the heart it's what thing and um And so Jesus explained that nothing, nothing that entered the, your mind, uh, your, your body, defiled you. It's what comes out of your heart. Now your heart is your very being. It's not only the, the organ that pumps and keeps you alive, but it's the, your whole being, every part, every aspect of you. And, and what come, it's what makes you tick. And what comes out of the heart is what you take in with the mind. And that's why Philippians 4, 8 says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think of those things. And Jesus knew that that's where we needed to be. Anything that comes out of our hearts can be um, defile us. It's not the things that go into our body. It's what comes out of our hearts. But if we are washed by the blood of Jesus and we continually are washed by the blood of Jesus, then we are, as the Bible puts it, saved. We are in the kingdom of God. Um, so I want to finish really is are you someone who thinks that you're a person who is good uh, who will get to heaven by coming to church regularly by helping others by obeying the rules or are you like that Sunday school boy who wanted to know how he could be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Okay, he didn't quite understand that, but that's what he was saying. How can I be cleaned on the inside? Have we asked ourselves, how can I be clean on the inside? And the answer is by being washed in the blood of Jesus. I just want to finish by saying, um, by reading you one more Bible passage, and that's 1 John 1 9, which says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.